Hello there. Hello. Hi, Irene. Hi, Casey. I am so excited to have you on Skype with me today. For those of you watching, this lovely woman that you're you're looking at is uh, Casey Baker, and I met her two years ago. I think it was two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. At an event in New York City. It was a very crowded room, and I spotted her far, far away. Um, but I knew I had to talk to her because there was something there was something about your spunk and your vibe, and there were a lot of people in that room at mm. Marie's event, right? But you were one of the few people that I actually knew I had to go and just say hi and make contact. So I don't know if I've ever told you that, but oh, I love hearing that. Mm -hmm. I, I was meeting you, and I remember that event. There were there was a lot of energy that was packed. Yeah lots of people. So we met and I actually um, have worked with Casey so she's been one of my mentors in helping me create my signature talk, what I need to say, how I need to say what I need to say because uh, those of you watching know my work. It's very complex, it's very intricate, there's a lot of detail and she brilliantly helped me condense it into the the important pieces that really needed to be portrayed. So thank you for that. Mm. Yeah. It's been an honor and I have learned so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The reason I wanted to bring Casey on is because she is an expert at teaching people how to unleash their voices. One of the main things I see in my practice, in my private practice, when I work with people who are coming in with various health problems, um, and Casey, you and I have talked about this a little bit, is a lot of their troubles are around not being able to speak up for themselves, not being able to say what they need to say. And what's interesting is that often this starts really young and Although they might be having trouble in a relationship in current adult life, if we go back, when was the first time you couldn't speak up? They remember you know, being at the kitchen table and wanting to tell mom about something or getting excited and, and wanting to scream and sing and shout, and they are told not to. Um, so mm -hmm. this is why I wanted to talk with you today about this subject and um, find out, you know, how what you do right now so for those of for those of um us watching what are you what what's your job what's your job title what's my job title yeah but my title i would <laughs> say is i'm a women's thought leadership and public speaking trainer got it and i'm also a speech writer so mm -hmm. i work with conscious women who are on a mission in crafting their messages and finding the internal freedom to get out there and share it and also learning how to share their message in such a way that they can become known for their message. Right. That's awesome. Uh, one little side, side piece. Do you ever work with men? Because there's probably some men watching this. I do. I don't, I don't advertise it. It's very rare and mm -hmm. it's very favor kind of basis because yep. my, my work is so rooted in my passion and commitment uh, to supporting the rise of, of women's leadership and the rise of feminine wisdom. Right. These things I believe in very, very much, but I absolutely do. Uh, okay. Men. Like one man that I work with is actually my husband, yes. uh, David. He's an amazing speaker, uh, but has been really getting out there to speak um, on some very new material. He's, uh, in, he's in the tech world in okay. Silicon Valley and has some very innovative thoughts around uh, employee engagement. Uh-huh. And in the business arena and what it takes to have authentic engagement within a team. Mm -hmm. And so I've helped him with crafting some of his talks. And then through him, there have been other people I've helped with their pitches for investors yeah. and that kind of thing for people who just know me. And, and occasionally I'll do that if I have bandwidth. Got um, it. But, you know, and, and it's fun. Yeah. And I love working with them. Keeps you sharp probably. It does. <laughs> it's different. It's, different. You know, it's just a different, it's a different vibe for yeah. me. It is yeah. a than, than working with women, but um, but it's fun. It's a um, cool. yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm curious. Well, I know your story, um, a lot of it, but I would love for you to share with um, those watching how how did you get into this? Because you weren't always doing this work. No, I wasn't. So how? What's the? What is the overview 
story of how you got to be sitting here today with me talking about helping people find their voice and speak up and write speeches. Well, the overview story yes. is that I actually grew up in a public speaking home. Oh. So my father is a phenomenal, I would call him almost more an orator hmm. than just a speaker. I mean, he is and it just, just, he's a, he's a powerful mm-hmm. presence. Mm-hmm. And growing up, uh, we had, one of the things we would do for fun was he would give me things to work on and I would write talks about them. Mm-hmm. And then I would practice speaking and I would go off and run for different campaigns through middle school and high school and these kinds of things. And he would yeah. work with me on my talks. Okay. And so I got a lot of training there. And then my mother was very active in Toastmasters and I remember her you know, learning how to, to tell more humorous talks and her practicing things. And Hmm. so it was, it was, I got a lot of early exposure to that. It was in your blood. It sounds like my blood and my grandfather was a preacher. Ah, you know, I didn't know that. (laughs) This is definitely, you know, it's, I have a family of communicators, passionate communicators. And, uh, so that is partly my background, Mm -hmm. but you know, I, I actually, didn't really do anything with quote unquote speaking or anything leadership oriented after I left college. Uh, I was actually pretty lost for a while. I went into investment banking mm-hmm. and that was a big, very necessary wrong term wake up, wrong turn wake up call for me. Wow. Uh, and I ended up traveling for four years. I left everything and traveled and went through a major period of spiritual inquiry and growth and becoming more tuned to like, who am I? what is my authentic voice, yeah. right? Not just this intellectual dribble drabble that I learned to, you know, spin off in college, mm-hmm. but what is my authentic voice? And I really began to become very attuned to that. Mm-hmm. And I ended up, um, actually I, I studied, I, I was a, I studied tantric yoga and meditation. Mm-hmm. I went off to become a tantric yoga and meditation instructor. It was a big part of my life. And actually a lot of the energy practices that I've learned from that inform a lot of my public speaking training. Yes. Um, but I, in addition to that, I did end up becoming a spoken word artist. So hmm. spoken word, for people who don't know what that is, it's, it's a form of, uh, spoken poetry, uh-huh. a lot of cadence and personality and, and passion. And there's like spoken word jams you, yes. you search online and they're very inspiring. I've seen some, they're incredible. They're incredible. They're mm-hmm. incredible. And I actually had spoken word art of, that was very much fueled about my passion for nature and my understanding and the seeing that I have, but how important it is for we as a species, as we evolve to live much more in harmony with our world and sanely, how important it is for women to come forth mm-hmm. in their ideas and their creativity and their wisdom if we're going to address some of the major problems of our time. Yes. And my spoken word art was about that. And it was a big call to action. I I actually ended up having a bit of a following around my spoken word art. And I'll have women start to come to me being like, great, can you help me? Mm. I was like, Uh. yeah. (laughs) Because I lived it so deeply, right? I had lived the feeling held back in my own voice so deeply Mm -hmm. and found a lot of freedom and continue to. I mean, every day in my life, I teach most what I am learning all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that was, that was amazing. And it just, it was so effective, the work I was doing with women, they went on to tell other women. And then I started working with a woman, uh, on crafting her talk mm-hmm. for a fundraiser she was going to put on right. crafting it and then supporting her and her delivery of it. And that went so amazingly well. Hmm. I had a lot of people come and ask me, Hey, can you help me? And you know, I didn't have a mm-hmm. website for almost the first year of my work. It, just, it was all referrals. It was all totally organic. And then I started getting TED and TEDx speakers. So I lived in San Fran- I lived in San Francisco. It was very, you know, kind of part of that world. There's a yeah. big tech community there. And that actually took things to a different level. Yeah. It was a platform. It was a platform. And and so it all grew very organically. And that was in two thousand and eleven. And it's been three years now and mm-hmm. it's beautiful work. I do things. I have a live event that I put on. I didn't put on this last year cause I had a baby, but mm-hmm. I have a school that I, for the, it's called the school for the well-spoken woman live. Yes. And I work with women and writing their talks and then getting up there to give them in front of an audience of all women. And it's a big party. So I do that. That's mm-hmm. one of my live components. Mm-hmm. I have 
virtual training courses for people around mm-hmm. writing talks mm-hmm. or uh, even just getting clear on what you stand for and writing a manifesto and getting out there and sharing it, yeah. landing speaking engagements, the whole the whole trajectory Very of that. Cool. It's, so that's what I do. That's awesome. And it's it almost I I know um, it's a very therapeutic process, this work of crafting what you need to say and right? It it seems like oh. some it's like people think, oh, I've got to write a speech or craft a speech and they think back to high school where they're having to write an essay and it's tedious and but the work I've done with you is very therapeutic. It was very deep, it was very spiritual. Mm-hmm. Because you're having to dig up really core pieces from yourself in order to connect with others and what you want to talk about. Um, so it's it is very deep. So it's yeah, it is. It's very deep, transformative work. I mean, when you think about it, I, I get a lot of women to come to me who've been extremely successful in various capacities in their work and career, but the one thing that sits as a piece of unrest for them in their soul is what, what is the message I have to give to the world? Like I really want to speak about what I care about so deeply. There's a, there's a longing. And I think a lot of people, I don't think everybody has this, but I think for those who do, it's very strong that, well, I want to say this. I I do believe that every soul, every person's soul has a longing to express itself Mm-hmm. in some way, shape, or form that is a gift to others or that is an inspiring way in which they want to impact the world in some way. Yeah. That, and for many people, it is through spoken word, some it is through music, some it is through dance or art or whatever it is. Yes. But the speaking of, of these things, not, it, the, the actual giving of this is not only what makes for a fulfilled life, but it also it contributes to a healthy life. Because if these instincts are ignored or pushed down, go- that energy is still inside of us. The energy, that inspiration is still there, but it's going to yeah. manifest in some way. And sometimes it'll manifest in dis-ease, mm-hmm. discomfort, exactly. depression. It, all that stuff, all that health stuff. And that's a great um, segue into you know, this capacity for us to actually know what our impulses are and to tune into them and to learn from them and then how to express them. And I'd, I'd love to know, was there a time point in your life when you were suffering from any types of health problems that might have been a result of not speaking or speaking up? Yes, I, I actually went through a really intense period in my mid twenties mm-hmm. and very early thirties. Mm-hmm. Um, I had in, in a very intense case of, of cystic acne. Mm. Uh, it, it, I was, it was disfiguring. Wow. It was disfiguring. It was completely covered my whole oh. face. Ouch. Not only it was painful. Yeah. And it was painful for my heart. I, I hid behind it mm-hmm. emotionally. It was so intense mm-hmm. and you know, there was a lot of changes that I absolutely have had to make and coming to recognize that my system is sensitive Mm -hmm. and that there are things that I have to take into account in what I eat, um, caffeine, no, you know, and just really some, some health nutritional choices. But one of the biggest things has been about communication, Hmm. not only my communication to the world on a big scale, like being a public speaker, but I mean, Communication with your intimate partner, mm-hmm. communication with friends, communication with people you work with. Yeah. I held back yeah. a of communication. And when I finally started to see and notice that I was doing that and why I was doing that mm-hmm. and making breakthroughs around that to be open in my communication, which is something I still have to work on. Of course. Um, then... Uh, my life got so much healthier, happier, more peaceful, less stressful, mm-hmm. and my skin just, I mean, my skin changed so much. Was it sort of like a miraculous clearing, would you say? Or was, uh, it, t- or was it something that took time? Oh, it definitely, I think, is something that took time but was m- very noticeable, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, it definitely took time. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. 
I think that, in, and then it also became where if I would have my skin would break out, then I would know either A, there's something that I've been ingesting, mm-hmm. right? That sure. isn't right for my system. Yeah. And B, is there something that I'm not expressing? Yeah. Yeah. And that's been, that's been really huge. Mm-hmm. This is so, so crucial because the one piece that also goes into this is what are we genetically predisposed to in terms of our health? And I'm glad you brought up nutrition because it's very important. And it's what I actually studied in university before doing all this other stuff that I do. But I started to realize in doing the nutrition work that I would need a psychology degree to actually do really good nutritional counseling because there are so many... (laughs) right? There's so many other factors around how we choose our foods, the foods that we don't allow ourselves to eat, etc. cetera. Um, so the, reason, the, the piece I want to mention to those watching is that Casey talks about having acne with not speaking up, but it could be your digestion that goes off. It could be a migraine headache. It could be arthritis, you know, holding water and feeling very thick and heavy and almost edema-like. It can be anything when we're holding in these sensations, depending on our genetic predispositions, right? I mean, recently, one of the ways for me that, it, that it's been showing up has been um, having trouble uh, getting, like, falling back to sleep. Mm-hmm. And it's a big deal for me right now because I actually have a baby mm-hmm. and I'm nursing. And I'm nursing in the night. Yeah. But not being able to fall back asleep at three in the morning after you nurse, that is no bueno. It's it not good. <laughs> you know what's going through. It's, it's, it's a matter of becoming present, too, is, is to notice they're, they're all, um, they're what we call like open loop communications. Yeah. They're yeah. communications that have not been closed. Uh-huh. Open looped. Ex- and open explain loop, that a little bit. So open loop communications are, so, so for instance, uh, there was something, you know, one, one of them could be, um, simple little things. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, someone gifted me a exercise Skype class, okay. right. With one of their trainers that they live online, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. You're setting up scheduling. And I realized that I hadn't responded in a couple of days to her to let her know what time would work. And so I'm at 3 AM oh, thinking, I God, I've got to respond to her and feeling bad about it. I see. Something like that mm-hmm. could also be something that's much bigger. Something mm-hmm. about, like, for instance, right now in my company, we have a program that we are mm-hmm. launching and we're about to enter into enrollment for. Yeah. And there are many, many pieces that go into play in preparing for something like this. And there were a couple of things that I realized that I, you know, I, I a couple of choices that I wasn't totally on board with. And I wanted to be in communication with my team about this, but I noticed I felt kind of bad uh-huh. because I didn't want to hurt someone's feelings that I didn't, you know, I wasn't totally jiving with that idea. And so I was holding back on it. So here I am, I not communicating that, but mm-hmm. at 3 a.m. it's, it's going it's, on. It's, it's there. Itself. Yeah. And, and so these kinds of things, I think that's where they can start to show up. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's just like running around our yeah. psyche. But then they can start to show up. Like my body was really tense mm-hmm. those days yeah. and I wasn't getting sleep. Yeah. And left too long without addressing it, that can turn into chronic stuff in our systems. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I know it too well. I see it all the time, all the time. Um, one of the areas that, interestingly enough, that gets tight and tense when people aren't speaking and expressing themselves is their jaw, right? The jaw, the TMJ, the neck muscles. Um, even um, tension around the scalp because all of this expression it involves a very deep part of our nervous system, which we've talked about in the past um, in creating my talk, but it's that parasympathetic nervous system, the one that's very mammalian that allows us to express and to sing and to um, communicate with other mammals. And when we shut that communication off it's like we're putting a brick wall around our head around this whole area and even around our heart and it strains us right it really strains us so yeah I it's so true I think too what you said you know it was something in your team that you were you didn't want to hurt someone's feelings or even though you're the 
technical boss, right? Right? There's still, because we, we don't, we want to socially engage and make everything well. We don't want to rock the boat. But it's an interesting fine line in being able to assert ourselves and still be part of the tribe. That's right. Right? This, I believe, I love you're your saying this because I've definitely I've seen this in myself. I see it with a lot of women who come my way. You know, there's um, such fear about expressing what's true for us. Mm-hmm whether it be right, this like grander scale communication about your work in the world or whether it's with someone you're dating or your mother or your child Mm -hmm. or your friend Mm -hmm. that we so that there's such a predominant fear of either losing love or not having approval Mm -hmm. that we will hold back on our truth because of that fear. And what ends up happening are two things. Number one, it actually ends up at like much having a much greater chance of, of, um, of killing the flow of love yes. in the relationship. So number one, intimacy killer is withheld communication, mm-hmm. um, any form. And, and the opposite of what our mind, mind believes is actually most likely the truth with that, which is more authentic, open communication creates more connection in the flow yeah. of love. Yes. More vulnerability. Exactly. So that's mm-hmm. on the relationship side of things and the emotional side. Mm-hmm. But then there's also the physical side, which is that whenever you have this spark of, of energy inside of you, inspiration mm-hmm. or the feeling that something isn't right, mm-hmm. something is off, those are, those are things to, be, to really listen to when we don't listen to them and we either stamp them down yep or we uh, hide them, or we just numb out, or we get really busy on top of them, then what ends up happening is, is that that energy of either inspiration or something is off is still in our system, but it's not being expressed in a healthy way externally mm-hmm. yeah. or processed in a healthy way yeah. internally. And so it expresses, it, our body will express it for us mm-hmm. exactly. in not the way we want. Exactly. Hence your acne and... I too have had skin problems in the past, so I understand that as a way of it trying to release because we're not voluntarily releasing it. So the body just says, we're going to do it for you. Right? That's right. Right? So. And it's a really friendly thing. I mean, it's, it's trying to express it in the only way that it knows how, but it's not the healthiest choice. No, no. So I, I'm really starting to realize as we chat a little bit more how similar our work actually is. Hmm. It's just a different medium that we're choosing with how we work with people in terms of, you know, having people speak and be comfortable speaking and feeling the energies. Because I'm sure when you work with people, there are a few breakdowns that happen in terms of getting up on that stage and feeling all the energy that's coming through their systems, through your client systems and how to funnel that in a way that's, that's, um, healthy and not scary and not crippling. Yes. So I'm, I'm curious what would be, if there's somebody watching this right now, who there's two scenarios I'm thinking of. One is I'm going to talk about relationship. So I know that both of you and I were in good, healthy relationships with our men and we can speak clearly. What if there's someone watching who knows that they are not in a good relationship or they're not sure if it's the right relationship for them? Because relationship is key. And I say, I want to bring this up because people will come and work with me privately in my office. I don't do couples therapy and they'll go home. And if, if, the environment is toxic and not allowing them to express the work that we've done. It sticks, but it's like, eh, it doesn't, it can't fully do its job. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So what would, what, if you were to, what advice would you give a woman or a man who might be watching this? Like, how do you address this? I know it's a big question. Well, let me, let me back up for a minute and just say, like, first of all, I just want to say, you know, I, I feel very grateful I'm in a relationship 
right now or my partner and I both are very committed to learning how to communicate mm-hmm. in ways. And it is, it is, <laughs> it's not easy, not easy, <laughs> no, not easy. And learning to do it makes things easier. Yes. Um, however, I have had my fair share of being in relationship with extraordinary communication challenges I've gone through it at eras of it in my current, uh, mm-hmm. with, with David. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that almost always we come back to is one of the key places where there is struggle in a relationship. And let's say like you're in a relationship and you feel like there's a lot of struggle there. Maybe you want to get out of it. Or maybe you're feeling like resentful of your partner mm-hmm. in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, that the first place I would have you look before looking at the big question of like, is this the right relationship for me Mm -hmm. is to ask a couple of things. Are you, are you in tune with what is true for you and what you need and what you desire? Yes. And are you communicating about it in a healthy way? Are you right with your own truth, Mm -hmm. your own needs Mm -hmm. and your own Mm -hmm. desires? Are you allowing that to be free within you in a healthy way? That's even paramount before you bring the other person in. Right. And then are you communicating about it, being an invitation for those things with another person? Mm -hmm. And then how do you handle it when you get a no? Right. Because you may have some needs that you do need and you get a no from your partner. And Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, I think it's like, uh, it's very, it's very usual for us to think of, wow, if I'm getting a no from my partner, I got to go. Yeah. You know, the other questions you can ask are, you know, what kind of situations need to be put in place in order for that to be a yes for your partner? Mm-hmm. Um, is, is your partner the only person who can fulfill on that for you? Right. Like, I got to tell you, like, I'm really into body work <laughs> and <laughs> having my feet rub. Yeah. And I, I ask David all the time for foot massages and, 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 Sometimes it's so cold and it's crushing. Yes, 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 yes. It's so sad. <laughs> no, I am. I'm so sad. But that is his no. Yeah. You right? Need, and, and my need is still a beautiful need. You need like, to go elsewhere. Maybe I need to be going elsewhere for my foot rubs yeah. often, you know? Yeah. So he can come to giving me a foot rub with more pleasure instead of feeling like all the time like an obligation or something yeah. from me. So, so it's it's... That's a, that's a, the big question is before you look at like, is this the right or wrong relationship? Mm-hmm. Which you can easily go to is like, what, where are you in relationship with communicating around yeah. your needs? Yeah. And are you an open space for your partner to communicate their needs? You just read my mind. Yeah. Because it could be that the partner, your partner is actually desperately needing to say something and they don't even know they're needing to say it. So yeah. that so that energy that's being blocked in their system is actually causing a riff in in the connection in general between the two the two people or the family system if there's children involved you know why is why is little Johnny having trouble at school and I know this is true because I've seen it in clients it's cuz mom and dad are silently pissed off at each other and they're not saying anything and that little one is caught in the line of energy fire so that this is the thing it, it is about relationship though mm-hmm. it, this is i mean all of all this talking is, so, is relationship all of talking is relationship but but the so much of what happens if you've got like physical ailment stuff that's going on health challenges one of the biggest places to look about You know, because we're so used to looking for, you know, maybe I need this drug, maybe I need this therapy, maybe I need these supplements, maybe this, this, whatever. And all those things can be extremely important and valid. I'm not Mm -hmm. saying no. Mm -hmm. They have been huge for me. But the other thing to really look at are relationships. Yeah. You know, are your relationships healthy? And and when we say that, it really is like, is there a free flow of communication within yourself Mm -hmm. and with the other and in receiving about your needs and what you want? Boom. I love it. I'm going to finish off. This is a bit of, I'm a science geek. I'm a science girl, as you know. It's reminding me of a very important study that was done quite a while ago. I'm going to finish with this. Um, And it's written about in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books, actually, Um, the author of The Tipping Point and Blink and Outliers. It was an Outliers, and they studied a group of people on the east coast of the United States. They were from Italy, and they were from a town in Italy called Rosetta. And so this town was now called Rosetta. I think it was in Maine. And 
They couldn't figure out why this group cohort of Italians were not dying of normal westernized diseases like heart disease and cancer and nobody was alcoholic, nobody you know, was addicted to anything because the little town down the road who weren't from Italy, they had the same health practices. They drank, they smoked, they didn't eat well, they didn't exercise, so they did the same things. The, so there's the Rosetta people, the Italians, and the town down the road. Um, and the difference was that those in the Italian community, even though, like I said, they, they ate horribly, they drank, they smoked, lots of lard, no exercise, it was their relationships. They ate their lard-filled dinners um, and fried foods with friends, right? They, they drank... Yeah. They drank their wine with community, not alone watching television. So there was, they went to church, they talked, they sang, they played with their children, they lived in households with grandma and grandpa and cousins. That was the only difference. Um, and it's, it's been shown before in the Mediterranean diets. It's not the diet, it's not all those nutraceuticals, it's the community and the talking, and the grieving, and the crying, and the laughing, and so it's just, it's beautiful that you mentioned the relationships, because I always come back to that study, um, and it's the truth, it's epidemiology, so they're looking back at what has happened, right? Wow, that is so, it's so true. So, thank you so much, Casey, for taking your time out of being a mama and your busy schedule to chat for about 30 minutes with me and and provide um, those who are watching some little insight into speaking up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're welcome. Yeah, I love what you're doing. I think this is a huge piece. I'm not often invited to speak about this part of my mm -hmm. experience. Cool. Um, and it's a massively important one, so thank mm -hmm. you. More to come, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Ciao. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye.